Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in the practical series, Money Matters, how to make your money count for now and forever. Today, you'll learn the critical answer to this question. Is the prosperity gospel the true gospel? Today, I want to speak to you on the subject of the prosperity gospel. Is the prosperity gospel that we see on television here on the radio, uh, see in churches all over America, is that the true gospel, or is that a gospel that's off just a degree or so? Some people say, well, I don't really know what the prosperity gospel is. And so in your notes, I have a definition of the prosperity gospel, and and most would agree that this is, is kind of the guts of the prosperity gospel. What is the prosperity gospel? This prosperity gospel says that the believers have a right to the blessings of health and wealth, and they can obtain these blessings through positive confessions of faith and the sowing of financial seeds. And that's what you see so often on television That's what you hear so often on the radio, and that's uh, send in your seed of faith and whatever need you have, God is going to meet that need. It is truth that has a mixture of error. So what exactly does the Bible say about that? And, and recognize this. Some people that uh, preach a prosperity gospel, some are kind of light with the prosperity gospel. And others are very heavy with the prosperity gospel. It's kind of on a discontinuum. But whether you're light on it or whether you're heavy on it, it's still basically at the core the same message that God has promised health and wealth, and we can obtain the blessings, the material blessings, through positive confession of faith and the sowing of financial seed. So let's look and see what the Bible has to say about that. As I told you, the Bible talks a lot about money. Jesus talked a lot about money. And the big reason that he talks so much about money is it's very easy for money to become master. And that's why he talks so much about it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'll begin reading in verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain who suppose that godliness, walking with God, and the the scheme of the gospel is a means of financial gain. That's what he is uh, referring to there. And he says in verse 6, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment, when it's not the focus. He says in verse 7, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we can take cannot take anything out of it either. And if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction, literally drown them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many a a pang. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The prosperity gospel. I want you to 
Notice with me three insights regarding the prosperity gospel. Is the prosperity gospel dead on or is it one degree off? Is it the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul dealt with this in his day. And that's why he told Timothy about it. And he is telling us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit about this today. Three insights. Insight number one, the prosperity gospel emphasizes health and wealth. It emphasizes physical health and financial material wealth. That's just part of it. That's part of the deal. And it doesn't come without Scripture because there are Scriptures that those who hold to the prosperity gospel that they will say, well, the Bible tells us this. The Bible promises this. As far as health goes, what well, says in Isaiah chapter 53, by his stripes we are healed. They say, well, that means physical healing. Others would say, well, I think that might mean spiritual healing. No, 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 it means physical healing, and so they will make that case. They will say, well, you just look at the ministry of Jesus. How many people did he heal? Obviously, the Lord wants us to be physically healthy. They'll look at the blessings and the riches of those in the Old Testament. Abraham, the father of all who believe, was very, very wealthy with flocks and herds. And they say, well, you know, Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, he had lots of wealth, material wealth and flocks and herds. Job was very wealthy. Solomon, David's son, was so very wealthy, probably the wealthiest person who ever lived. Well, let me just share several things about this physical health, material wealth mindset. First of all, health and wealth are appealing to the unsaved man. It's very appealing. You preach a gospel that talks about having physical health and material financial wealth, and that is something that a lost person says, hey, I'm interested in that. I'd like to find out more about that. Tell me about that. Tell me how uh, I can have that. Because what's on the mind of a lost guy, a lost girl? What are they thinking about? Money, family, finery, pleasure, vacations, stuff. The Bible says that the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth, and if you don't have a relationship with God, you're not thinking about the kingdom to come. You're thinking about the kingdom right now. You're thinking about what is. And so that is on your mind. And a health and wealth gospel, well, that appeals to somebody like that. And if you preach that kind of message, you can draw a big crowd. And doubtless, lots of people have big crowds that are talking about health and wealth. God wants you healthy, and God wants you wealthy. One thing that you have to watch for that the Bible makes very, very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but a natural man, a natural man is an unsaved man. He's just in his Adamic nature. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But if you talk about health and wealth in this world, in this life, physical health, spiritual, uh, physical health and material wealth, well, a natural man understands that, and that appeals to the natural man because that's what a natural man wants. That's what he thinks about. And so, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, uh, when it comes to the prosperity gospel, that, that verse doesn't fit because a natural man says, tell me more. Tell me more. I am interested in learning about how God is going to fill up my bank account and how he is going to give me such great health. Now, remember, too, not only are health and wealth appealing to the unsaved, but health and wealth are temptations used by the devil. You say, where in the world does it say that, that the devil uses health and wealth in his temptations? Well, you remember when Jesus was baptized? It says, then the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and then he was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days, and he became hungry, and then the devil came to him. And the devil came with three temptations. The first one, 
If you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. It's a temptation for health. You're looking a little peaked there, Jesus. What about if you worked on the flesh here? What about if you took some bread? Command these stones to become bread. That has to do with health. And uh, Jesus didn't buy into that. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then the devil uh, took him to the kingdoms, showed him, as it were, the kingdoms of the world in an instant. And he said, all these are mine, and I will give them to you if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall worship God, and him only shall you serve. There's a temptation for health. There's a temptation for wealth. The last temptation Come to, he took him to the pinnacle of the temple, and he said, jump down, Jesus. Do a couple of backflips, because it is written, he will give his angels, angels charge concerning you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Oh, Jesus, you can wow the people if you will just do this, and they'll look at you and say, what a miracle, what a, a, just an amazing kind of guy. Well, surely he can do all this. You know, the Bible says that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the, from the Father, but is from the world. And command these stones to become bread is the lust of the flesh. And I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world is the lust of the eyes. And jump down and you won't hurt yourself and you'll, you can do all these backflips and all this stuff. That's the boastful pride of life. That, those are the three bullets that the devil has in his gun. And he came at Jesus tempting him in the area of health and wealth. Very interesting. Second insight. The prosperity gospel, not only does it emphasize health and wealth, but it emphasizes positive confession. Positive confession. Now, what did I tell you? I said this is, this is one degree off. So there's lots of truth mixed in this, but one degree off can cause you to land in the ocean. Positive confession. Well, is there not positive confession in the Bible? Did Jesus not say in John 14, verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. I want you to think about that for a minute. Is the Lord Jesus really saying that you and I can ask anything that we want, and he's going to do it? Is he locking himself into that kind of a situation? I don't think so. I think what John 14, verse 23, or 14, verse 13, has to be understood in this light. Whatever you ask in my name, whatever you ask according to me, according to my will, and according to my ways, because God is not going to do things that are not according to his will and according to his ways. God doesn't just do whatever you say. We all remember the story of Aladdin and how Aladdin found a lamp. And as he began to shine up that lamp and rub on that lamp, all of a sudden, boom, out comes a genie. And the genie comes and says to Aladdin, Yes, master, I will grant you three wishes, whatever you want. Yes, master. And the genie calls Aladdin master, and Aladdin is his master for those three wishes. The Lord is not your genie in a bottle. He's not your genie in the lamp. He's God. He's God. He is the master. He doesn't come to any of us and say, you just tell me what you want because I'm your heavenly bellhop. I'm your flunky, your lackey that just does what you say do. Whatever you ask in my name, it doesn't have anything to do with, with my will. Just whatever you ask in my name that I'm going to do it. Well, that's not biblical, and that's not true, and that's not right. The Lord's not your heavenly genie. And the Lord doesn't do our will, we do his will. It's not about our will, it's about his will. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the cup was coming to him, and he was praying, and he was sweating drops of blood because the pressure as the weight of the world was crushing down upon him, he cried out to his father, and he said, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, 
not my will, but thine be done. Lord, it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. Jesus taught us to pray the model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not our will be done, not your will be done, not my will be done. His will, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to remember that it's about his will. And when you pray, there is confidence in prayer. And 1 John chapter 5, I think, clears up any confusion about John chapter 14, verse 13, and it says this, and this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. It's according to his will. Ask anything in my name according to my will, and that will I do. Now, we hear people say, well, you know, what what do you want? What do you want? What what dream is in your heart? What desire is in your heart? What, What would you like to have? Name it and claim it. Name it and claim it, because it says that you can name it, whatever you ask in my name. Some have said, well, you know, that theology is name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, confess it, possess it. It's all kind of lumped in there together. It is rhyming words. Now, is that true? Can I name it and claim it? No. Can't name it and claim it. One in in the prosperity gospel movement said, you can command your mourning. How do I do that? God didn't give me the authority to command my mourning. Well, the Lord can do whatever he wants. He's the sovereign king, the king of kings and lord of lords who dwells in unapproachable light. So we don't tell God what to do, and there's no such thing about name it and claim it. Let me tell you what there is. Real faith is not name it and claim it. Real faith is believing and claiming what God has said. It's not name it and claim it. God has to, claim, has to name it in order for you and for me to claim it. And that's, the, that's the, uh, the confusion. That's the one degree off thing. That's the five minutes difference in the clock. It's the Lord wants us to walk by faith. He wants us to take his word and claim the promises that he has in his word. He wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. But he has to name it in order for you and for me to claim it. We don't name it. He names it. And once he names it, then you latch on to it. Say, God, you promised. You promised me in your word. He has said so that we may confidently say. He names it, and then we claim it. The prosperity gospel, it emphasizes health and wealth. Secondly, the prosperity gospel emphasizes positive confession. And thirdly, the prosperity gospel emphasizes material blessings. That is the focus, especially on the heavy-duty prosperity gospel, on that continuum that's heavy, heavy on the prosperity gospel. It's, it's all on the material things. John MacArthur said this, Word of faith teachers have corrupted the heart of New Testament Christianity. They have moved the believer's focus off sound doctrine worship, service, sacrifice, and ministry, and they have shifted it instead to promised physical, financial, and material blessings. Those blessings are the cargo that God is supposed to deliver to those who know and follow the word of faith formula. So what is the focus? What is the emphasis? What is the goal? It's the stuff, the material stuff, and that's how you keep score, and that's how you know that God is pleased with you because you have lots of stuff. Paul said, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Paul didn't have a lot. But that's not the goal. That's not the focus. As I told you before, we have that little phrase, he who dies with the most toys wins in our world. That's what the natural man thinks. That's what prosperity theology, when it's run amok, that's what it teaches. It's all about you having a lot of stuff, a lot of wealth, because that equates to God being pleased with you. John Piper 
has a video out that's very popular. It's about 10 minutes long. He says this, why I abominate the prosperity gospel. He hates the prosperity gospel because he sees that it's another gospel. And John Piper says this, the problem with the prosperity gospel preachers is that they have an over-realized eschatology. They take the things that are promised in heaven and they say those things are promised to us now on earth, and they're not. They're not. Does God have uh, abundance for his children? Yes. When do we enter into that? Now? No. When we go to heaven. What eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor, nor has entered into the heart of man. All that God has prepared for those who love him. We think gold is so wonderful. Men lie for it, scheme for it, cheat for it, and, and it's so important to us. Gold, God paves the streets in heaven with gold. I mean, you talk about an opulent place. You talk about a beautiful place. And if you overreach and say, well, the things that are in eternity, I want them now, it doesn't work that way. Paul said this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There is glory to be revealed. Does it pay to serve Jesus? Yes. But are there hardships? Are there trials? Are there difficulties? You bet. You bet. You talk to the Apostle Paul. Hey, Paul. What was your life like before coming to Christ in terms of material things, in terms of pleasures and things like that? Oh, man, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Gamaliel student. I was, man, I was doing great. I had lots of things, and I had respect, and then I came to Christ. Oh, what's it like now? Oh, I just got beaten last week, lost everything. I was in Corinth, and I didn't want to ask those people for anything because I didn't want them to think that I was taking from them, so I was bivocational, and I would work all during the day and then preach in the evenings. He says in Philippians chapter 3, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, count them but dung, literally is what he said, in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There's suffering in the Christian life. And you know what? Paul suffered as a believer. And one day, they cut his head off. And he was okay with that because in the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He was looking forward to the future. Momentary light affliction is producing for me an eternal weight of glory. Does it pay to serve Jesus even if you don't get all the stuff? Even if you don't get physical health and wealth and material blessings? It pays to serve Jesus. And it pays to believe the truth about the gospel. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, with your money, your heart and your money are tied together. So here's the question. Have you given your heart to Jesus? Has there ever been a time where you've surrendered yourself to his lordship? If not, that day can be today. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's message 
Is the prosperity gospel the true gospel? Is available on CD, DVD, or MP3 download when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. From His Heart Ministries, we have the privilege of sharing the life-changing Word of God around the world through television, radio, and online and it's making an impact. I recently received this note from a man in India named Hadi. He writes this, I live in India and am so thankful I can see you each week. Because of the clear way you teach, I can understand God's word so much better. I am changed, keep it up, thank you. We're blessed to receive letters like this often. And it's a testimony to wonderful people just like you who are supporting from his heart and enabling us to share the truth with passion and full conviction. Now, asking for support is not my strong suit, but we need your help, especially this month as we close out our fiscal year. Our goal is $150,000 by June 30th. Now, this financial target will help us expand from his heart, allowing us to walk through new doors of broadcast opportunities waiting for us. So will you please pray and ask God what you could do to help us reach this challenging goal? Now, remember, I take no income from From His Heart. I'm a volunteer and a monthly supporter. So every dollar you give goes directly to reaching more people with the good news of Jesus. Now for your timely support this month, we have some special gifts we wanna send you to help you in your walk with Christ. Thanks for your prayers and financial partnership. May God richly bless you. For your fiscal year end gift today, we'd like to say thanks by sending you Pastor Jeff's powerful four message series Money Matters, how to make your money count for now and forever. Along with his companion booklet, Are You Worried About Money? Just call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org to make your gift. And thank you for standing with us to reach a lost and a hurting world. And thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real